Good morning, Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen. This is a session I was particularly looking forward to because, Dr. Kissinger, it's such a special pleasure to welcome you back here to Davos. And of course, for me, it's a special pleasure because I had the honor to meet you in the 60s when I was a student at Harvard University. The session which we have today should become a kind of framework for our geopolitical discussions which we have here in Davos. And uh, it's entitled The State of the World, a Strategic Assessment. And I couldn't think of anybody better to provide us with the insights to understand what's really going on in the world. I don't want to list, uh, Henry, all your um, achievements as a se national security advisor, as a uh, secretary of state, as a professor. Um, what's much more important, I think, is the influence which you have had on international politics over so many decades. Henry, your first trip to Davos dates back to more than 30 years. In 1980, you delivered actually the opening address of this annual meeting. And it's very interesting, I read again your, your speech and you spoke at that time about the constantly changing world, and I quote, and the age of global interdependence. You warned of a delusion of confidence in classic economic models, a challenge to the capitalist system. But you also noted, and I quote again, a demoralization of the socialist systems which nowhere have produced the satisfaction of human personality. As we will have many discussions in the next days on the geopolitical and geoeconomic affairs, your insights share, shared this morning will certainly be of a kind to enlighten us all. So please welcome Dr. Henry Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger, we will run this session as a dialogue. And my first question to you, uh, we will look at all the different regions in the world, but my first question uh, starts with the region which is probably of utmost concern at this moment. It's the Middle East. Um, the Middle East, essential for global security, essential for global energy supply, we were all of great hope two years ago with the Arab Spring, but now we see the whole region moving more to extremism. You have three different kinds of Islam um, competing each with another, the Saudi Arabians, the Iranians, the Muslim Brotherhood. What, what is your assessment? And how worried do you feel about this uh, development which we see in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. <clears throat> well, Klaus, first let me thank you for your very friendly introduction. And uh, when I think back to the first, uh, my first visit to Davos, which was just a CEO meeting of uh, uh, maybe the two front rows, <laughs> and uh, when I see it today, it is a triumph of vision because there are many CEO meetings, but there's only one Davos, and that's a tribute to Klaus. Uh, the second point I want to make, since uh, 
you will ask me probably about different regions of the world, not realizing that I probably will take all the time with the first question. Uh, I want to say a few sentences about how I look at the world. Because in the American public discussion, there's often the argument, should one look at the world from a realistic point of view or from an idealistic point of view? I think that is a false a dichotomy. One has to begin with an assessment of the situation as it is. If one cannot do that, one cannot make any predictions about the future. But one cannot rest on the situation as it is because what happens, especially in times of turmoil, it's the challenge of moving the world from where it is to where it has not yet been. And that requires vision and idealism. And my answer to all these questions will be characterized by that attitude. Now, of course, we really, we could spend the whole hour on the Middle East, and I'll confine myself to an analysis of the situation uh, as it now appears. The, uh, the Middle East, for one thing, is a, a system in which the states, many of the states, were artificially created at the end of the First World War. So the borders of these countries were not chosen by historical evolution uh, and by a shared national experience. They were drawn by the victors of the First World War, none of whom were Middle East countries, for the strategic convenience of the countries concerned. So therefore, the nation as it exists in Europe and Asia, has a different significance in the Middle East. There are exceptions in Iran and to a large extent in Egypt, but the other borders are permeable. Secondly, the Islamic religion that is professed by all these regions, has in its history the notion of the unity of all religious believers. And so therefore, it makes the national borders, at least to those who believe in this principle, uh, uh, much more transitory. Third, there has emerged in that region the most current issue and the most urgent issue of nuclear proliferation in uh, the case of Iran. And a key element in this is that for 15 years, the members, the permanent members of the Security Council have declared that a nuclear Iran is unacceptable, but it has been approaching. And so within a foreseeable future, people having advanced that view will have to come to a determination of how to react or about the consequences of non-reaction or abandoning, in substance, uh, uh, this policy. And I believe this point will be reached within a very foreseeable future. Fourth, there is the competition that, to which Klaus referred of the various 
Islamic radicalisms with each other. <clears throat> Fifth, there's the evolution of the Arab Spring, which was greeted with enthusiasm by the outside world and was interpreted as the emergence of pluralistic democracy, but has in fact produced as the dominant party in every country uh, political organizations that are difficult to reconcile with pluralism and that have in their history affirmed a very universalist uh, uh, position. Six, there has been the experience of Libya, which the Western countries uh, dealt with as an affirmation of high moral principle, and those principles were accurate, but they are now in the process of learning that every action has strategic consequences and that one cannot just choose a part of the action and then uh, abdicate from the remainder. Then there is the problem of Syria, which at first was interpreted as a fight of democracy against the dictatorship, but which has transformed itself into a conflict between various ethnic groups and in which the outside world finds itself in the position that if it intervenes militarily, it will be in the middle of a vast ethnic conflict. And if it doesn't intervene militarily, as I have urged it not to do, uh, it will be caught uh, in a human humanitarian tragedy. And uh, so the outcomes that are conceivable there and I'm doing it purely analytically, would be an Assad staying in office, a total Sunni victory, or an emergence of a loose federation of various ethnic groups, each of which uh, each of which has its own consequences. As for the outside world, to the degree that it competes with each other, it makes the situation worse. And so I have always advocated a Russian-American understanding, which would then probably be backed by all the other permanent members of the Security Council as the first step towards defining what the uh, objective is. Uh, then there is the by now historic uh, Palestinian problem and, and the uh, issue of the survival of Israel. It is a strange situation in this sense that a consensus has developed in the world of a outcome, but nobody has yet been able to determine how to get there. And the element of uncertainty with respect to this is that is how, how to get a negotiation started. 
but also how to define its parameters. And I would like to state a personal view in that connection. Uh, the, uh, there's no doubt that any settlement will require significant sacrifices on the Israeli side from the position they now hold, whatever the details of this are. But I would like to appeal to the Arab people present here that there has to be some reciprocity on the Arab side other than just declaring the word peace without defining it. There has to be something that changes in their conduct other than uttering the word peace, some concrete uh, arrangements so that uh, Israel, which now finds itself in the position of surrounded by absolutist Islamic uh, states, can justify to its own people that a peace that is emerging has some concrete content. And the final point is, this, of course, is an issue that has essentially, organically, internal dynamism. But the relation of the outside powers to each other is uh, crucial in determining the volatility of the system. And in that respect, the changing energy patterns will produce a necessity uh, of reevaluating the strategic role of various countries in the region, not as a question of choice, but as a question of the inherent changing of various weights that emerge. Dr. Kissinger, if you look, you, you provided us with a comprehensive analysis now. So is it, uh, President Ob Obama has been re-elected. What are the policy options he has? Uh, I think everybody expects the United States to take a more active role in the region, but what are, what are actually the policy options which are open? The, uh, President Obama, well, first of all, I mean, the audience knows that uh, President Obama was not my first choice in the, in the last election. But it should also know that I believe that foreign policy has to be nonpartisan and that I will do my best to support the policies unless a huge ideological objection would arise, which I don't. Uh, now, the challenge we face is twofold. Uh, first, uh, the uh, United States has to draw some lessons from its recent experiences. And from that point of view, some of the previous involvement in the region in the military field uh, will diminish. And the capacity, the willingness to intervene in local issues of balance will be altered. The second is that when America learns the lesson that it is still probably the most powerful country in the world and certainly an indispensable country in preserving uh, order, it will redefine those things it can do, but it will also learn to do better 
the things that remain uh, for it to be done. So I would expect that the administration will deal in its early period with achieving some clarity about its objectives of relating non-proliferation to the region. And so I would expect Iran to be high on the agenda. Uh, the president has also repeatedly stated that he favors an, uh, a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian problem in the form of a two-state solution. So I would again expect some activism in uh, in that respect. Uh, I have also already indicated that the Syrian problem would best be dealt with internationally by R Russia and America not making it a contest of national interests. Now, when I say I expect this is not a directive, I, that I, it's my analytical expectation. And I would hope that the undertaking of the United States in foreign policy will not be characterized by the divisions that we have seen on domestic policy. Henley, I, I would like to come back to one issue because it's such a dangerous element in, in global affairs. I refer to the so-called red line which, uh, to which uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu referred in his speech uh, to the United Nations. And what you uh, said before, we are getting closer to the red line. What can the world community do? to avoid that we uh, slip into a kind of uh, unwanted um, uh, tragedy? Uh, it, uh, one has to decide two things. Uh, what one means by an Iranian nuclear capability. At what level does one assess it to be so close to military option that it has to be dealt with as a military option? Uh, and the second then is who should deal with it? Uh, I believe unilateral action uh, by Israel would be a desperation last uh, resort. Uh, so one should give these negotiations a real chance and uh, conduct them flexibly. But the Iranians have to understand that if they keep using the negotiations simply as a means to gain time to complete a nuclear program, that the situation will become extremely dangerous. Because the consequences of an Iranian nuclear program will be that other countries in the region will be, feel impelled to to adopt similar programs, that the credibility of the countries who have talked about unacceptability will be severely damaged, and that if nuclear weapons keep spreading into regions where the technical sophistication with which they were handled during the Cold War period is very difficult to implement across a broad range 
and where the political passions are so great that we ca could then be approaching a point where nuclear weapons become almost conventional and certainly some sort of nuclear conflict might arise. That, I believe, would be a turning point in human history. And uh, so the uh, issue should be a subject of intense negotiation over the next months, undertaken seriously by both sides. And uh, the possibilities of finding a solution, one to the definition of what a nuclear capability is, and secondly, what its consequences are, should then be uh, explore, uh, seriously explored, and that Iran should ask itself this question. For the United States, and I think for all Western countries, there is no challenge to Iranian national identity or, or Iranian development. Uh, if Iran acts as a nation and not as a revolutionary cause, there is no reason for America or any other permanent member of the Security Council to be in conflict with it, nor should there be for any regional country. And on that basis, uh, I would hope that a negotiated solution will be found in a measurable time. Now, Henry, when we talk about nuclear powers, you have actually uh, in the region, you have Pakistan. Yes. And uh, the political situation in Pakistan is not uh, the most stable one to, to express it, let's say, Diplomatic. uh, diplomatically. Uh, how much are you worried uh, about, uh, about Pakistan in the long term? I'll be in deep trouble when I leave here. <laughs> uh, look, I, uh, I have great respect for Pakistan. I, uh, in 1971, uh, was accused of, of uh, uh, being too sympathetic. Uh, uh, I'm worried about Pakistan because the trends that I have described mm -hmm. of Islamic fundamentalism are gaining ground. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty of, uh, of establishing a civilian government uh, have not been overcome partly because of the differences uh, between the regions. Uh, Pakistan has demonstrated enormous sophistication in developing nuclear weapons. Uh, unexpectedly, and could become a source of uh, proliferation in the region. And uh, the and uh, when that happens, then the issues with India and over Afghanistan. Uh, what one should hope to achieve uh, is is this uh, is first. Uh, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan is now being left under conditions which will produce a political vacuum. Uh, and I believe it is imperative for the surrounding countries, uh, which of, in which, of course, Pakistan is an enormously important part, and Russia and China, and in the end, Iran, uh, and India, because it is so affected by it to come up with some notion of how to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a center of disturbance uh, in the region. And in that context, uh, with Pakistan being given a respected place in it, and it being made clear to Pakistan that its security concerns are understood, uh, it may turn out that uh, 
that some progress can be made. But I, I, right now, one has to say the challenge for Pakistan's stability is, uh, of course, in the first instance, a Pakistan problem, but also a world problem. And so withdrawal from um, Afghanistan, will it have a positive or negative effect? Well, the withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, became a necessity in terms of the American uh, situation. And, and one of the lessons we have to learn is that our capacity to change domestic structures deep in other continents, in uh, uh, far from the United States, may, is not sustainable by American public opinion. So I have understanding for the uh, uh, presidential decision to withdraw. But one cannot act as if 10 years of history leave no requirements for a legacy. And so I believe that it is necessary to create a political framework which we should encourage, in which the surrounding countries address the prop challenge of how to prevent another terrorist center from being directed at, at surrounding countries, which given the history could really be any of the surrounding uh, countries. Uh, I often use the example, which is much simplified. Uh, in 1830, when Belgium became independent from the Netherlands, the question was how, what to do with what had been the battlefield for over a century between the European great powers. And the idea was then developed of Belgian neutrality guaranteed by surrounding countries. Neutrality is not the word we are looking for here. Uh, and it would be much more complex because we, we are not concerned with armies marching in and out. Uh, but some concept like this ought to be elaborated by surrounding countries, some of which have conflicts with each other, but which might unite on this. And if that were established, then Afghanistan could develop internally by its own, uh, by its own maxims. And in this sense, I, the American military withdrawal, which uh, is inevitable, should be coupled with a political uh, arrangement to prevent the same situation from rearising. If we turn, and uh, this week, of course, has seen the 57th um, inaugural ceremony of uh, U.S. president, and the U.S., the United States was always known as uh, the country which was integrating people from all over the world. And now there's a big concern about polarization in the U.S., um, not only politics, but also uh, society. Do you feel, Henry, this is just a political phenomenon which will go away? Or do we have here a deep fundamental societal change uh, as far as the American population is concerned? Of course, I'm an American who was integrated. And I came to America not speaking English. And uh, it was, from that point of view, a very coherent society. Uh, now, I, I would say the polarization has a number of, of, of causes. Uh, one is the complexity of the issues that are in, involved. Uh, I was on the board of a company that fell under some regulations. And even its lawyers couldn't figure out what these regulations meant. And they went to Washington. And the, and the 
congressmen who had voted had to refer to their stats. So when the public finds, when, when documents are 2,500 pages long, and out of such enormous consequence, and the public has no possibility of understanding the issues about which the fight goes on, uh, this leads to a certain frustration with democracy on one side. Secondly, the way political debates are now conducted in all countries, but especially in the United States, is moving democracy from an effort of persuasion to an effort of manipulation. Uh, the uh, great debates in England were addressed to individual voters at mass meetings where candidates debated. The same in the United States in the debates prior to the Civil War and right up to the New, the New Deal. Now technicians are running campaigns, files are kept of 40 million people in which it may be possible that the headquarters of these campaigns know more about the total habits of the people than certainly their neighbors and maybe the families. That introduces an element of rigidity into the system uh, because it results in a statement that are geared to uh, producing uh, uh, emotion. Uh, third, the uh, even I, uh, the longest period I served was in the Nixon Ford period, and we thought we had it pretty enough. Uh, uh, but at that time, there was still a, a kind of understanding between the Congress and the executive branch that on some key issues, one could act uh, on most of them in a united way. This is now uh, uh, much more precarious. Is it inevitable that this continues? Uh, I'm worried about uh, the way the debate is now evolving. And of course, there has been a demographic change in the United States. Uh, and uh, so that many of the new immigrants do not have the ties to Europe uh, that their the previous ancestors had. Uh, so these are all worrisome phenomena. On the other hand, at least the America that I see, which may not be cover all aspects, is still a country that believes in itself. It is still a country where the government, in the end, will be able to have sacrifices of its people. And the conditions that I have described are a challenge to our leaders. They are not an organic necessity that needs to continue indefinitely. But couldn't you, coming back to your basic philosophy, couldn't you say uh, the U.S. becomes more and more a pragmatic, realistic, uh, legalistic society missing the normative, the value-based, uh, the idealistic dimension? And I think this dimension was so important to provide the U.S. with credibility in international leadership. No, I think the idealistic element of America is inseparable from uh, the American role in the world. And you cannot justify foreign policy in America in the long term simply by a balance of power approach or a purely uh, legalistic approach. And indeed, I would say that the, that the, that a very significant element uh, in the United States uh, is distorting things by an excessively, I wouldn't say idealistic approach, but an excessively moralistic approach. Uh, I think the neoconservative uh, element uh, would certainly be that. 
And then there are many people with whom I sympathize from my own experience who believe that America has a moral duty to intervene militarily wherever human rights are, are seriously violated. Uh, uh, that is a very significant mm -hmm. el element in the uh, American debate. Uh, the present debates are about finances, and they, of course, have a major legalistic element, but they will come down to one question. In the name of what can America ask sacrifices of its people? It will have to ask sacrifices. And I think it will after it works through the present process. And so that is really an idealistic debate and not a legalistic debate. But Henry, if you were to address the, the American people and you would ask for sacrifices to reduce the debt load, to bring the house in order, what would you tell the American people in a, to addressing, let's say, the more idealistic uh, dimension of it? You see, the problem is that uh, the, the mechanics of uh, First of all, the mechanics of the presidential selection now means that candidates have to debate in, ever in 50 states on the basis of local state issues. And that the people who come out to vote in these primaries are the activists. So uh, the presidential selection system, uh, and this is, I would apply that across the board, which is uh, the debate does not bring before the American people a, uh, an appeal on, on uh, general principles. On the other hand, I think that if the present debate continues in this, on this level, some rebellion will arise. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what form it will take. I'm no expert on domestic uh, issues anyway. I'm saying that as an, uh, uh, as an observer. Uh, uh, but I would predict that when it is resolved, it will be resolved by somebody emerging to appeal to something higher than the purely financial issues that are now being put forward. Henry, one of the most impressive books uh, I have read, and I have been probably 70 times in India, uh, in, in China over the last um, uh, 35 years, 34 years, is your book on China. And uh, the uh, people speak now about the so-called G2 as really what matters in the world. How do you see the evolution of US-Chinese relations, particularly now, where you have a transformation of uh, leadership in China. And I should include into my question also um, the more assertive role which apparently uh, Japan will play in this context. Uh, the US-China relations plays now have, will be, in my view at least, acquiring a certain symbolic character uh, for this reason. Uh, they are the two countries that will be developing the most active economic relations around the world. They will interact with each other everywhere. They provide the classic example of an emerging country and a status quo country working out uh, their coexistence. And what history would teach one about this is that these countries will conduct an, an increasing rivalry and that this will lead to constellations uh, and to some kind of uh, at least diplomatic conflict. But I think also that we are living now in a world where this traditional pattern 
of which I've written a lot and which I understand very well, where this traditional pattern has to be superseded. There are issues like energy, proliferation, uh, environment, that can only be dealt with on a global basis. If the United States and China fall into a Cold War pattern, uh, every country in the world will be asked to choose in some fashion, will therefore be split in some fashion. Uh, and at the end of this process, one doesn't learn from history any achievement other than when countries like this have played out their roles, like Germany and vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Europe, they face exactly the same problem with which uh, they entered it. So in that sense, I believe Sino-American cooperation is extremely important. And in a certain kind of and, and a close cooperation should be attempted. But I don't think there should be a G2 in which China and the U.S. try to run the world. Uh, this has to be in the context of a broadening of the base of international cooperation away from the, in which emerging, in which countries like India, Brazil, uh, the brick concept will uh, play uh, an increasing role. The relationship between China and the United States will be inhibited to some extent by differences in culture. China thinks more strategically. America thinks more programmatically. Uh, China has lived with a sense of constant danger from its neighbors. America has never had neighbors that were an immediate uh, uh, led to it. Uh, both countries are now undergoing transformations uh, domestically, uh, but that is the fundamental challenge of the relationship. When you have said this, you go into, then you get to, re to details. The injunction I would urge on both sides is, of course, being great powers, they have to work on settling their disputes. But they have to find something they can do jointly so that there is some experience on, uh, on, on both sides. Now, Japan in this will play a key role, being a major country in the region. Japan is undergoing a transition now from being primarily an economic country, which was an unnatural result of World War II, to becoming more active in international affairs and sorting out, in the Japanese way, the various options it has. And one can see in Japan elements that want to continue the association with the United States, which would have to be modified, however, by the qualifications I put on the American role in the earlier part of our discussions, uh, by others who are arguing, even in the face of many storms, for a closer association of Japan with some Northeast Asia bloc, and a third group which would pursue a more national policy. This Japanese debate is carried out in a manner that is more elusive and less uh, programmatic than debates are carried on in the United States and in other Western uh, countries. Uh, but it, it has to be understood, and one has also to understand, that a decision China, Japan makes in its options will affect it, be affected, importantly, by what kind of Sino-American relationship will develop. And uh, 
by the assessment in uh, Japan of how the various parts of the world are really evolving. Anyway, we are in a week um, where based also on the speech of uh, Prime Minister Cameron, who will join us any moment. And um, the future of Europe is very much, I would say, debated. I, I don't say in question. Now, how you are such a European specialist, you, you follow the um, in-depth European um, uh, history. How would you define the ideal Europe in five to ten years from now? Well, one underlying problem is the one I described also for the United States, which is what sacrifices can be asked of the publics. And the reason it's an underlying question is because every country, and it's, it's also the American problem, has to adjust its public expenditures in relation to its capabilities. Uh, and it will also affect the evolution of Europe because the cohesion of Europe and the solution of its existing problems depends on the willingness to make sacrifices uh, on the part, first, of the people immediately concerned, but on the part of the other Europeans. I would think, as an observer, the issues that need to be solved is the relationship between austerity and growth. Uh, to what extent necessary sacrifices may, however, do be hard to translate into growth because they go beyond the sustainability of the political systems. Uh, and if there is no growth, then the economic cohesion uh, of Europe will suffer. The second question is to what extent those countries that have the capacity to do so can be asked indefinitely to pay, bear the burdens of uh, helping uh, the countries that have slid into uh, these difficulties. And if answers to these two questions emerge to be negative, which I'm not predicting, uh, then the question will be what happens to Europe. And there I would say, whatever happens, uh, the idea of European unity needs to be preserved. Uh, and it may be that for a while, and maybe for the next phase, one has to shift from the great idea of the 50s and 60s, which was to approach unity by economic construction, to approaching unity by political construction. And I would not accept the proposition that if these other questions cannot be answered creatively, that that has to be the end of Europe. Uh, Europe should be maintained as an ideal, uh, even if the ideal solution uh, does not emerge. So if I, if I understand you, we have at the moment in the political discussions a conflict between Europe as a economic unity or as a political unity. So you would argue Europe has to bring his house, its house in order, but the end game has to be the political union. So that's based on Absolutely. the historical process, and that's the only way how Europe can and, survive. And that, in perhaps the, the ingenuity that brought European economic unity to this point should now be transferred to the political field and maybe it may be that for a while 
the political field has to be given a high priority. Yeah. And when we speak about Europe, you would speak not only about the continent, but you no, would... I, I would include... Uh, I would include the UK, of course. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's a great transition uh, to the next session where uh, Prime Minister Cameron will, will address us. But I would like, um, you always have been my mentor, Henry, and I think today you shared your insights with us let me just say, we are very grateful for your presence because I know it was not easy for you to come to the States and to be back. So I hope that you come. We know all of your age, uh, but we wish you that we still, and we wish us, that we still have other opportunities to see you back in Davos. Thank you so much.